the specific way they disobeyed God is not letting the land rest. Man, that's, that's if wild. you didn't know who this God was, you would think he's somewhat worse than than people are trying to save trees. Because mm-hmm. I don't know of any environmentalist or tree hugger that made somebody go into t- t- captivity for 70 years for cutting a tree down. Mm-hmm. Well, Matt Landis, welcome back to the podcast. It's been a, a little while since we've done this, and uh, we've been talking about doing this topic for a while, and I'm very interested to get into it. I don't think we've done an episode on this before, mm-hmm. and these things can be a little bit controversial, so we'll see where we where we all land. But this is on the topic of stewardship of God's creation. Mm-hmm. Um you know, some people have used terms like creation care, things like that. Uh, and you've done a lot of thinking, a lot of studying on this. And I'd love to get you some of your thoughts. So let's just jump right in and mm-hmm. start with define that for us. Like, what is stewardship of God's creation? Where does this come from? Uh, and yeah, we'll use that and then just, just kind of go from there. Yes. So first of all, what I would like to say is, you know, very simply – you know, stewardship of God's creation. And I think of it in in kind of three ways, taking care of the land, uh, taking care of animals, um, and people. So there's kind of three parts that I'm, the way I'm thinking about it. And and it's really, you know, in in Genesis, God says that we are, you know, man was put in the garden to cultivate it and take care of it and and rule over it, reign over it. Uh, And really, that's what God has gotten uh, is asked us to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the things I wanted to say up front, uh, if, if I can do that, and that is that I am not an expert. I'm not coming here as someone who has uh, figured out how to, you know, at, at some high level, how to take care of, of the earth and animals. I'm, I'm a, com- a computer programmer. Uh, and so <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm not a farmer. Uh, and, you know, in interaction with animals all the time or the land. In some ways, I'm a little uh, apart from that. But I am interested from the perspective of being a Christian. How does God, you know, as we live in our world today, uh, what, is, what is our call um, to steward what God has given us? You know, he has given us things. He's given us resources, land. Uh, animals, resources, other people, and how do we take care of them well? Mm -hmm. And uh, another maybe caveat, I am not really interested uh, in getting tangled up in in political arguments about Mm -hmm. this uh, or posing as an expert on the science. I know sometimes we can feel like we we know a lot about the science, and I'm going to come and be very frank and humble. I don't know all the answers to the science questions uh, of what's happening. And I'm just going to put that out front where the way I'm coming, I would approach this is what does God say? Hmm. You know, what, what, when we, when we read the scripture, when we listen to what God has to say, what, what does he tell us about taking care of what he's given us, uh, taking care of his creation? So, and, and the other part of it, I would say is, as Anabaptists, bringing it down to us as a people. How have we historically uh, understood God wants us to live and steward what he's given us? Uh, so kind of those two pieces. What, what does God say in, his script, in the scripture? And uh, what, what have we as a people, as a specific kind of Christian, how have we approached taking care of God's creation in the past? Um, so maybe those are just some... Uh, preface. I mean, and one of the things that kind of maybe shaped my thinking on this, um, you know, of course, over the years, you hear the arguments, you know, cl- gro- uh, climate change and global warming and, and you know, intense feeling about environmentalists and tree huggers or mm-hmm. however else you might refer to them. And we, we, one, one day we got a paper from the Effort of Borough and it was a flyer on how to be green. I'm like, oh, interesting. Uh, I'm going to take a look at this and see how, how, how we should change our lives to be green. And I started reading it, and one of, them, one, of the, one of the items was, only run your dishwasher when it's full. I'm like, check. 
Rosalind and, and we are green. <laughs> and the other one was things like be careful about recycling your old things. You know, don't just throw them away in the trash, but recycle them. And I'm, check, we're green. And there was a long list of items, and we passed on every last one of them. Hmm. And, and Rosalind and I were talking about it, and we're like, the reason we're green is because we've been trying to be good. We weren't trying to be green or environmentalists or anything like that. What we were trying to do is follow God to be careful stewards of what he's given us. Hmm. And it essentially checked all the boxes of what many people think it means to be green. Hmm. So uh, that's That's really interesting because... These conversations, it feels that they've been very hard to have in the last 30, 40 years. There's kind of this shift that has happened in the broader conversation in society to where it's become highly politicized, you know. And and if you read stuff maybe older than that, you don't really get that. But now anything to do with taking care of the environment or something immediately brings to mind, oh, you know, you're a leftist, you're, you're on the right, you're this, whatever. It turns into politics really quickly. And that's where hopefully with this, getting some of what you found, like what does scripture say? And then what have our people done historically? I'd like to hear a little bit more on the, on the history for the Anabaptists when it comes to stewardship of creation. Would you have anything on that as well? I will. I'd like to say a little more actually about you, you, you triggered some ideas that I'd like to talk about and what about this, this, environment that we live, which is very conducive to overreacting to overreactions. Mm -hmm. God has told us to be good stewards, and and we're going to make the case for God very clearly commanding us to be good stewards, uh, what what he's given us, the land, uh, animals, resources. But we probably even as a a particular uh, Christian group as Anabaptists, we maybe are in danger of overreacting to people who have maybe taken some things a bit too far. Mm-hmm. And we want to make sure that we're not overreacting to overreactions, but resting on what God has taught us and just calmly continuing to do what what what, what God has taught us and or has communicated to us in the scripture uh, about how we should respond to it. Instead of responding to things politically, I'm convinced in our day and age when everything is so white hot mm. that we always have to pause and, and, and put the issue through the way God frames it. If we respond to things the way they are framed in the environment that we are, in the news envir- environment, in the political environment, we will not say the right things. So we have to stop Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we have to say, how does God frame this and what is his answer? Mm -hmm. Uh, Otherwise, I'm I'm convinced we're going to be overreacting to overreactions. Mm -hmm. I I, I think that's – we just have to stop. That's that's a really good point because – I have I have friends that talk about this in all kinds of different angles and shapes and sizes and whatever. But it's it is really easy to try to align with oh well what this person says is where my position is and so that puts me on the left or the right or the whatever. Uh, but very rarely have I heard people say well yeah whatever what does God say? Let's go to scripture. Okay, I'm going to try to do my best with integrity to have a position. That's aligned with that. Excellent point. And maybe another way to say that is that the opposite of the person I disagree is 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 rarely the right answer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, as a matter of fact, as I noted mm-hmm. just a few minutes ago, when I looked over the green checklist, how to be green, I realized how to be a good Mennonite was precisely the same items. Live a modest life. Don't be wasteful. Mm-hmm. Be careful with the things that you're given. Um, don't live the consumerist throwaway life. Um, and I'm not here to argue that I am perfectly embodying that. Um, but I'm saying, what does God say? And can we align with that? So, yeah, very, very good point. Yeah. Yeah, that that makes sense. So, so here's one, though, that I've heard that might be a little outlandish, but I, I, I think it's relevant. Back to what does God say? What does Scripture say? I've heard this from many places. And that is, oh, well, Revelation says this whole world's going to burn up anyway, and we're living in the end times. It's about to happen any minute now because they're just convinced that the world is just about to end and it's all going to get burned up. So why should I care? And I've heard that regularly used as, oh, this is a reason why environmentalism, whatever, what have you, stewardship of the creation, that doesn't apply to us. What would you say to that? Because that's someone trying to say, oh, well, 
see right here it says, I mean, it's, it's all going to burn up. So it doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. I would say there's two part, maybe two parts to that question. Number one, uh, let's say, let's, let's for the sake of argument, agree that it's all going to burn up. Does that make it any more right to disobey when God says that we ought to be good stewards of what he's given us? Mm-hmm. So let, let's, it, even if it's going to burn up, does that mean that we, um, you know, just, just destroy the farmland around us? Um, does it mean that be, because God is going to destroy the earth, everything that he said about uh, being good stewards doesn't apply? Mm. So that's the one part of it. And uh, of course not. If it's going to be uh, destroyed, God's st- we're still supposed to be good stewards. The other question is, um, is there any hints that creation will be renewed rather than destroyed. So this is, the one isn't dependent on the other. Uh, just because it's going to be destroyed doesn't mean it dis- we disregard all of God's inc- uh, commands mm. to be good stewards. And the second question though, is, are we on solid footing that it's just going to be simply destroyed? That's the that, second question. See, that, that's a really good point because when people use this, they, they would say with great confidence, you know, like, oh yeah, it's all going to get destroyed. So it, it doesn't matter. And then that's that's the kind of the crux of the, of the whole argument. And I've always wondered about that because you, you've also been referring back to, yeah, but there's all these other scriptures saying to take care of what God's given us, take care of the, the earth, whatever, however you want to phrase it. I mean, we see that right in the Garden of Eden and a lot of other places. Uh, is this is are these people too confident perhaps in their position that just says oh it doesn't matter because it's all going to get burned up anyways so yeah walk walk through that a bit destroyed versus renewed what does that look like because um, I feel like it's not quite clear in my own head and <laughs> yeah so so help me out with that so Christians good Christians disagree on this point of uh, emphasizing the destruction or the renewal uh, I was. Uh, at Maranatha Bible School as a teacher, and there was discussion. You know, which one should we emphasize, that it's going to be renewed or it's going to be destroyed? Hmm. And uh, there is evidence in Scripture for both. We often think that the earth is going to come to, uh, you know, a sudden end. But then we have verses like Psalm 148, verse 6, talking about the creation, and then it says, he has established them forever. Oh. And Hmm. Ecclesiastes 1 and verse 4, generations come and go, but the earth remains forever. Hmm. Now, that's really interesting. I've never picked up on that one before, actually. And and there's more. Hmm. There's those verses, but there's others that uh, we often think of, you know, we we often would emphasize. Hmm. uh, And and this is not to argue that there's no arguments on the other side. We obviously have 1 Peter 3, Mm -hmm. um, so the the, the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Um, Hmm. But there is yet, you know, so this idea, a hint that creation, the molecules of creation will in some sense survive that. Is there any other hints of that? Well, there's another one. Uh, Christians believe in the resurrection, the bodily resurrection. And and, and this is another oh, one that yeah. has faded in the background. So go ahead. Ooh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I wonder if I, I think I might see where you're going here. Because that's something that I very rarely have heard about, talked about, it, the, the bodily resurrection and things. Like, it feels kind of fuzzy in my head. Is it because, oh, this, this is kind of confusing, can't really wrap our heads around it, so it's not, exa- it's not like a topic of conversation <laughs> very often? I would, love, I would love to hear you d- dig into this one because I feel like this is a pretty important piece. I do Cause, agree. Because it, well, it seems to fit with these themes of renewal. Uh, resurrection, you know, there, there's a lot of these themes flowing through the New Testament, but I don't feel like I've, yeah. I know nearly enough about this, so I'd, I'd be happy if you'd dig into that a bit. And, and I do agree. In our day and age, we we think and very much think in terms of uh, when we die, we we become disembodied and we go to heaven. And yeah. uh, what we would actually, we actually, if we want to be very careful about how we talk, what we actually believe is we go to the intermediate state which is before our bodies are resurrected. So, um, mm, okay. and, and not to, to geek out too much, um, <laughs> but what happens to us when we die now, and, and, and we would say this in our, in our statements of faith, that we believe we go to the 
we are disembodied. We no longer have our body. Um, but someday, the ultimate hope of all Christians, and this is not some, only some Christians, is that we have the hope of bodily resurrection. And, and, and if, if, if it's hard to believe that, then my next point will be it, – it'll be – but if we believe in some kind of bodily resurrection and classic orthodox historic Christians do, and we, we, are, we have a less – in our day, we, even Mennonites would have a little bit less of a grasp on that. Uh, I, I think you're correct in saying that. Hmm. But that is what Christians believe, and, and I'm not being uh, controversial when I say that. If we are going to be bodily resurrection, that means that some of the molecules of God's creation are going to survive in mm. some sense. And that is a hint that more could as well. Do you understand my argument there? Yeah. So yeah. if we are bodily – if we plan to come mm. out of the grave mm -hmm. and all, all Christians, all classical Christians, when they think carefully about it, they do – agree mm -hmm. that we are going to come out of the graves, right? The, mm -hmm. the dead in Christ shall rise first. Mm -hmm. It's not they're not going to stay in the grave. The, the body that was buried is somehow going to come out. With, and, and we can, there's, you know, a lot of questions about how that all be. What does renewal all mean? But in some sense, what God created will be raised from the dead. Mm -hmm. Like Jesus was raised from the dead. Did his created body stay in the grave? It disappeared. Mm -hmm. The molecules that were in the grave were renewed into a new body. And yeah. so there mm -hmm. is at least a hint in this discussion about will, will, will what God created be destroyed or will it be renewed? In, in my mind, there's a strong hint in the resurrection of Jesus and the resurrection of all Christians that it will be renewed, not destroyed and disappear. And so one part of the three pieces of creation uh, – in, in the beginning, I said I'm going to talk about kind of three pieces, the land, animals, and humans. Mm -hmm. And we, we are pretty convinced as Christians that humans will be bodily resurrected. That points that possibly some of the rest will be renewed as well to answer those who mm -hmm. feel that they're very confident that it will be burned and destroyed, um, mm -hmm. um, that, that, that they're – Something will come through that fire and be renewed, mm -hmm. not destroyed. And and maybe this is – and I'm a little shaky on all of the connections between Genesis and Revelation, for example. But you see it seems like there's a lot of um, – uh, pointing back to Eden and, you know, and yeah. saying, hey, this is what's going to be in the future. This is going to be renewed, restored. Yeah, there, there's a lot of imagery tied with that and it feels like if we – take the perspective, oh, it's all just going to get burned. It doesn't matter. Trash the place. It don't matter. It's all going to go away anyways. It feels like we're missing a real important piece there. If It feels like we're missing a significant chunk of what the New Testament is saying because it would seem that there's scripture that would say there's more than just humans are going to be renewed and restored, right? I mean, yes. It, and, and is some of this- This would be what, a, good, a, good, a good segue to talking- I, I, Earlier, I was saying there's, there's there's kind of two tracks I'd like to follow. Yeah. One is, what is the arc of what God has said about taking care of what he has created? And the other mm -hmm. one is conservative Anabapt or Anabaptist, Mennonite, Amish uh, feeling about this this topic of being good stewards of what God has given us. Yeah, dig into that a bit. Yeah. So I'm going to uh, – first of all, mm -hmm. let, let's follow a little of the arc of, of – what God says in Scripture. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what, the way the way the story starts, and this is not unfamiliar, it starts that God created, uh, you know, the earth, the land, the animals, the plants, and when He gets done, He steps back and He says, "It is very good." Mm -hmm. It's 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 it's. He, he said, "It's good. It's good. It's good." And then when He gets done, He said, "It's very good." Mm -hmm. It's like He's just stepping back and looking at this amazing creation that he made. And he's not just talking about humans. He's talking about everything he made, his, the whole creation. And, and, and God himself, he steps back and doesn't say, you know, I'm just going to just waste it. And when it's all done, I'm just going to destroy it. Mm -hmm. What he steps back and says, almost like he loves what he created. It is very good. And, and so God himself really is impressed with what he made. Um, 
And there's someone else who is not impressed, and he wants to destroy it. He wants to, he wants to mess it up. He wants, to, he wants to do anything he can to mar what God created. And of mm. course, that's Satan. And we soon realize that creation gets marred. Mm. But, but God, as, and then, so, so we have generation, uh, gen, Genesis and, and God saying it's, it's very, very good. Um, not this dismissive attitude toward it. And it, this is all of creation. We move along and uh, we get to Leviticus. Uh, we get to Leviticus 25 and 26. Uh, and, and we could maybe we could back up to Genesis, or, or sorry, Exodus, where he gives the Ten Commandments. And one of the things we miss when we read the – often miss with when we read the Ten Commandments is when God talks about uh, his Ten Commandments – one of the things he gives a lot of attention to, more than anything else, the significant portion of the Ten Commandments, is that his creation should rest. It, I think it's about 30% yeah. 30 of the Ten Commandments is God talking about this, that we think, well, what, huh. why are you wasting all your time on rest? <laughs> and guess what? Wow. Humans rest. And like the most amazing animal rightist, Mm. More amazing, even than the animal rightists of our day, the animals need to rest too. That's that's such a good point. I hadn't thought like about God that. It's beats, right there. Yeah, the, yeah. God, God outdoes the worst animal rightists we can imagine, mm. especially in the Old Testament. The animals get to rest. Mm. God cares about his animals. And then we, so we, so we have, and, and I, we could back up a little bit related to the animals once again. Um, one of the things you notice throughout the whole Old Testament is that the animals, and we talked about, you know, a little before we started here, the animals share in the judgments along with humans. When humans are judged, the animals are judged as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so, of course, when the flood was, the, the animals were all destroyed. The ones that were saved were the ones that, that, that Noah brought into the ark. In some way, what I realize, what that what that gives us a hint at, is that the animals and humans' uh, salvation history is somehow connected. I don't want to overstate it, but in some way, it's it, it is connected. So at the flood, they had to go into the ark. Um, then we get to the to the Ten Commandments. God not only gives humans rest, but the animals can also rest. Um, this is kind of following the animal track. And then we get to Leviticus uh, 25. Mm -hmm. uh, and Leviticus 25 uh, is, is the passage that's written on the American Liberty Bell. Proclaim liberty through all the land. Um, so oh, okay. the American, and it, it's, it's, it, it, it's Leviticus, I forget which verse it is, but it's, it goes around the rim of the, the American Liberty Bell. Huh. And so it is the, the passage that talks about how God envisions that humans will find liberty. And interestingly enough, hmm. it, there's no war involved. You don't get liberty through war, but there's something else that is mentioned, very, 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 very much emphasized. And that is the land needs to get rest. So mm -hmm. a, a significant portion of God's vision uh, and, and – in Leviticus 25 is this idea that the land needs to get rest. He cares about it. It needs to get rest. And this whole idea that the, the land needs to get rest mm -hmm. is connected to, to humans having liberty. This passage, Leviticus 25, and some people say, what's Leviticus 25? Well, number one, it's on the American Liberty Bell. But number two... Oh. It is the passage that informs Isaiah 61. But Isaiah 61 is where uh, Isaiah introduces the gospel in the, in the Old Testament, mm. uh, which is exactly what Jesus quoted in Luke 4. And help, okay. me, help me out. Well, yeah, the, isn't that the section the where... The spirit he... <laughs> of the Lord yeah. is upon me. To bind up the brokenhearted, to mm. set the liberties for uh, set the set the captive free. Mm. Leviticus twenty five is very significant because uh, Luke four, where Jesus encapsulates the gospel, points mm. back to Isaiah sixty one, which points back to 
Leviticus 25. That's so, I and never, Leviticus I never 20, that. Yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, read it and, 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 and follow hmm. the, tra- the progression. But a huge thing about how humans get liberty is giving the land rest. Giving, uh, and, and, and what's involved in that is also having a reset occasion where the land goes back to those who owned it. Hmm. Another significant thing in Leviticus 25 so, you know, a couple of things about liberty. It is, uh, it's not about war. It's about, um, it's about the land getting rest. It's about the land going back to who really should own it um, so that they have the resources they need to live well. So, and it's also about sacrificing. So if, if, a, if a rich man got a poor man's land, he gave it back. Hmm. And there's a reason he gave it back. And that is because the land is God's and we don't own it. I think that's a pretty significant piece there, isn't it? Because oftentimes in these conversations, it it's this sense of I can do whatever I want because I own whatever. It doesn't matter if it's mine. I can trash it. I can whatever. But scripture is saying something pretty different here. I've never thought about that chunk in Leviticus where it's like, it, well, um, actually rewind a bit. We did an episode with um, John Roth on a significant uh, scripture that the early Anabaptists quoted extensively, and that's from Psalms, where it says, "The earth is the Lord's." You know, yeah, God there you go. Owns it's the, it's you, repeating you know, Leviticus twenty-five. Yeah, it's like um, they were really big on that. Of this, this, this place this is the God's. You know, and we are here to, um, you know, we 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 dare not presume too highly of our ownership or or our, our rights or you know whatever. You could you could pull a lot of different pieces out of that. It feels like that's a pretty significant connection yeah. piece there, yeah. isn't it? And yeah. very much. And, and, and you know, we kind of could segue over to, and we'll, and we'll do that a little later. Mm-hmm. Um, but Mennonites really having in their mind that, that we, you know, we need to be thankful that God is it, it's the land is God's. And, mm-hmm. you know, now we are in, in the United States in, in 2024, we are extremely confident that the land is ours. Yeah. And we think in terms, I've got the deed and, mm-hmm. and, and, and the land is mine and uh, I have a bunch of rental properties and they're mine. <laughs> um, right, right. Christians, uh, Ju- uh, the Jewish people and Christians throughout history, the land is God's and we we're caretakers of his land. Um, yeah, that's easy to say in like an ethereal sense of like, oh, you know, everything I own is God's. You know, you hear people say that, but like you're, you're bringing it down to like really tangible. I mean, the the deed to your piece of property, whatever, you know, this is actually God's property or like really pull it back to ground it, so to speak, not to not to use a pun, I guess, but it is really that I, I just had not thought of the the connection pieces with with Psalms, you know, the earth is the Lord's and then what you're saying from Leviticus. These are significant pieces of the puzzle. That, but let's continue. Yeah. Uh we're kind of we're kind of taking this this arc yeah. of, of God, what God has said throughout the word and, and we're we're letting the environmentalists and the, <laughs> the political arguments off to the side. Mm-hmm. We're 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 not well, worrying about yeah. it. We're just <laughs> focusing <too. laughs> on what God says. Yeah. And so as we move then, then, then we find another interesting. We, we we can make another interesting observation, and that is that we we often would think in terms of God always prioritizes prioritizes people over the rest of the creation. Mm-hmm. But is there any times when when it seems like it's flipped a little? And there mm-hmm. is. Why did Israel go into captivity captivity for seventy years? Well, uh, both Jeremiah and Chronicles tell us why, and that is because the Jewish people did not let the land rest. Hmm. So the way wow. – so, so once again, can you actually make – because someone doesn't steward ground, steward ground like, like you've asked them to, mm-hmm. they did not take care of – of, of the land and the ground in the way that you've, you've requested that they do, people can actually suffer in captivity for 70 years while the land gets its rest. God said, you wow. didn't let it rest and it built up 70 years of rest that it deserved. And I'm going to send you to captivity for 70 years to let the land get its rest. 
Now that's interesting because so what we're saying is scriptures is pretty strongly implying then human suffering can come as a result <clears throat> of not taking care of God's creation like he asked us to, essentially. That's a perspective I'm not sure I've ever picked up on. But yet, as soon as you said it, <clears throat> as, as soon as you said that, I was like, oh, yeah, that's that's right. I mean, I remember, you know, you're reading through Jeremiah or whatever, and you see that, and you're like, whoa, that's, oh, that's not quite what I expected. You know, that that's an interesting thing for God to say. And I've never put the pieces together of what you just what you just said there. That's we wow. would often emphasize that they disobeyed God. Yeah. But the specific way they disobeyed God is not letting the land rest. Man, that's, that's if wild. you didn't know who this God was, you would think he's somewhat worse than than people are trying to save trees. Because mm -hmm. I don't know of any environmentalist or tree hugger have made somebody go into captivity for 70 years for cutting a tree down. Mm -hmm. Second Chronicles 36 and verse 21. Um, so the message of the Lord spoken through Jeremiah was filled. The land finally enjoyed its Sabbath rest, lying mm. desolate until the 70 years were fulfilled, just as the prophet had said. So it's, Man, I'm, that, not, I'm not wow. making it up here. Wow. Um, that, I mean, and it's interesting because I know I've, I've read that multiple times and I've never really put the connection together, you know, and mm -hmm. again, it's this thing of, if you don't take care of what God has given us, you know, the earth is the Lord's, then not only is that not doing what he says, sure, but but there's also real human suffering that comes as a result of that too. That's a, that, that wow, that's something for, I'm going to have to contemplate on that. You know, that's not something we, we do not talk about that. Like, I don't know if I've heard it described like you just said or, or phrased that way. Mm -hmm. Um yeah. Anyways, yeah, that, that'll well, definitely make you think. Let, you know? Let's keep let's keep moving. So someone might yeah. say, "But what about the New Testament? Does the New Testament talk about this mm -hmm. as well?" <clears throat> there, there's two in Acts two, uh, when when Peter is talking on the day of Pentecost. I think I think I have that correct when he says, "You know, he talks about the restitution or the renewal of all things." Mm -hmm. What is he talking about? Is is it back to this idea that hmm. uh, you know we know that we know that humans are going to be bodily re resurrected, but connected to human salvation is the restitution of all things. Hmm. That sounds pretty encompassing. Yeah, and, and once again, hmm. you know, not to not to overemphasize something. Mm -hmm. uh, there there are Christians that believe you know that the earth will be destroyed. There's others that 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 would emphasize that it will be renewed. Hmm. Um, another passage that is often overlooked, um, we often think uh, that the book of Revelation is a passage that talks about, um, you know, a vicious destruction of the world. Uh, yes. I was wondering if you could dive into the, the Revelation one specifically, because I'm quite sure we'll be getting a lot of comments of people saying, what about this section in Revelation? Um, so, yeah, yeah, walk us through that. Well. One of the things for those who are are, are very um, uh, dismissive of being good stewards of God's world and you know living consumerist lifestyles and just just burning up the world by mm -hmm. the, you know living uh, not simply and being a good steward, uh, Revelation uh, eleven and I'm doing this by memory. Re Revelation eleven and verse eighteen. One of the judgments in Revelation is it says God will destroy those who destroy the earth. This is not one that I hear emphasized a lot. I don't but know if I've I ever heard quoting, that. Uh, Whoa. <laughs> Re Whoa. Revelation 11, uh, 11 and verse 18, I think it is. I'm not sure if I've yeah, written Actually, yeah, let's, let's pull that up here. Let me see if I can, uh, I can find that because, okay, so we've heard – I've heard all kinds of different things about <laughs> Revelation. I mean, there, there's lots of, of ideas. Um but I don't know if I've ever heard that verse talked about before. Let me see if I can find it here. You said verse 18. It says, The nations raged, but your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged, and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. Mm -hmm. That's that Another is translation wild. in yeah. Revel is Revelation eleven eighteen. God will destroy those who destroy the earth. I'm, I think that's maybe an NIV or okay. Yeah, um, that's. I mean, it's, that's right there. Wow, I don't know if I've ever heard 
someone talk about that verse specifically. That's not one that really comes up because because it's so interesting because I've usually heard it flipped the other way around. It says this whole thing is going to get burned up anyway, so it doesn't yeah. matter. Like material creation is yeah. not And there is also, you know, you know First Peter 3, mm-hmm. um, where it talks mm-hmm. about the elements melting with firm heat. So that is, you know, once again, there is, there is two. But another, you know, along with this Revelation 11, 8, it seems like that, that, that says something about God's desire. Yeah. Um, when it, he is, yeah. and, and it's not only that, hmm. I will make all things new. And I'm not even sure which verse I'm quoting there, but that, that is mm-hmm. another sentiment of the book of Revelation. So yeah. is, 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 it, is the sentiment that, that he's going to restore, well, he's certainly going to restore uh, humans. You know, we're going to be restored to, to what it was meant to be. Uh, of course, there's a bit of an open question of exactly how the rest will be, re- you know, may all things be made new. But it feels like uh, God created creation. And when he stepped back and looked at it, it's very good. And when he gets to the end, he's still saying that I'm going to make all things new. And those who, who have destroyed the earth, I'm going to destroy. So there's, there, there's, there's kind of a unified message there, I would say. And that's kind of the arc as I see it. Um, that, that's of, fascinating. Like that's, that's a whole arc through scripture. And of course, we, we did this pretty quickly. I'm, there's a lot more I'm sure you could dig into with all this. But th- hopefully this is something to get people's interest to dig into this more. Because mm-hmm. what you were just describing there, I don't know if I've ever heard someone framing that arc of scripture and say, okay, like, look, you know, look how this is presented. Um, and I'm kind of curious, I, I'm wondering why, you know, I don't, I don't, yeah, and we don't have to get into that necessarily, but it could be these things do tend to be controversial at the present time with caring for God's creation and things. And that kind of makes me sad. And so anytime this seems to come up in conversation, people are like, oh boy, you know, it, yeah, yeah, you tree hugger, whatever, you know, and it's like, oh, can, can I love how you're good to go, okay, what does scripture say? Let's look at that. Don't worry about whatever's in the news and all that stuff. Just what what is God saying here? Um, so anyway. Yes. And there is another side to it. Um, mm-hmm. We can be idolatrous. Uh, we can uh, we can worship creation. Mm-hmm. But that, that's not the point mm-hmm. here. And I don't think there's a lot of danger, uh, you know, of Christians in the circles I move of doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, but that is an opposite danger that is possible to, you know, to worship creation. We but, are called but, to steward it, mm, but not yeah. worship. So. It, and isn't that something in the prophets of, where they say they worship the creation and not the creator, yes. right? So and they address the book of that. Romans as well. Yes. Yeah. So that, or, or, there's, yeah, certainly, mm-hmm. there's certainly that side. But apparently it's possible to really care about the creation and take care of it, mm. steward it, live simply in a way that is not worshiping it. Uh, because God seems to really care about creation uh, yeah. if, we fo- if we follow the ark. Hmm. So where does that leave us here and now? We're recording this in, you know, 2124. We're here in, you know, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And whoever is listening to this, wherever they may live. Okay. So we took them through, or you took them through this this sweep of scripture and uh, some some good perspectives on this. So how should this affect their lives and how they think about the world, how they engage with um, society, uh, how they live their lives? Yeah, bring this down to an individual level. What I would like to do, if I can, mm-hmm. I would like to back up now. We looked at the arc mm-hmm. of the scripture. So another thing that we as Anabaptists can look at is, is how we have historically thought about some of these issues. Uh, and if we could just mm-hmm. spend a little time, if I could spend a little time mm-hmm. just talking about that, uh, this idea of not so. First of all, we looked at the 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 sweep of you know how God has talked about it or in Scripture how how we've. Uh, but there's an, another another thing that we have that we can look at our own you know our own past the things that we have emphasized before we were over before we started overreacting to overreactions. Um, <laughs> you know, we thought in terms you know growing up in my church. Uh, we 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 had an a lot of encouragement to drive economical small hmm. economical vehicles, and and oh, this that's was interesting. Mm-hmm. Exactly, um, hmm. you know, when I was growing up, the church leaders in my church, you know, uh, 
you know, uh, a Dodge K car, just a small economical car. That's kind of what they envisioned as a good car to drive, something that is efficient. It's not big, luxurious, um, uh, consumeristic. Just drive something economical, efficient, and affordable. SUVs were, were frowned on. No way. Oh, this yes. is fascinating. Okay. As a conservative Mennonite church. Hmm. Um, you know, the, the encouragement was, you know, for stewardship and simplicity, you know, drive as small and as economical as a car as will do the job. Hmm. Um, and, and once again, SUVs, you know, you know, that's a luxury. Vehicle. It's, it's a bigger vehicle than you really need. Do you really need to be driving that? Um, and just be careful, you know, be careful about that. The other thing, um, you know, when, when we're, we, we don't travel in luxury, mm. you know, maybe, maybe one reason is that we, you know, we just don't have the, you know, we're not in the kind of money that would allow that. But even if we could, you don't travel in the utmost luxury. Uh, so even if a Mennonite could afford an executive jet to go jet to some conference, you would not, on the basis of uh, of stewardship and simplicity, you know, living a modest lifestyle, you don't use it. Huh. And so, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, perhaps faithful Christians who are listening to God's word and wanting to be... Uh, you know, live a simple, modest lifestyle that is being a good steward, uh, steward is more effective and con consistently taking care of the environment than, an, than, than a billionaire activist environmentalist. Um, jetting to conferences to promote green, or do we have Christians who are obeying Jesus and actually living good stewardship? You know, among Mennonites and Abbas, that's what we, we, we have historically encouraged. You know, just live being modest, simple stewardship. Uh, in our, and I don't know if I have it with me. I thought I tried to bring it in here. Uh, in our uh, Articles of Faith and Rules and Discipline, we, we say this uh, on page 12, the simple life. Considering Luke 12, 13 to 21, and 1 Timothy 6 and 6 to 11, we believe that the spirit of materialism is not in harmony with the Christian life. And we urge our members to live the simple and unselfish life. Extravagance and intemperance in any form are not consistent with the teachings of the Scripture. And, and this was not triggered by you hmm. know, any you know, wrong emphasis on taking care of, of what God has given us. Um, but scriptural simplicity and stewardship. Mm -hmm. So we, we talked about uh, transportation. Uh, we looked at just generally being, uh, you know, having a simple, modest lifestyle. Mm. Uh, but another thing that we might think about, uh, and this is an older story. This is a story from colonial America uh, on the question of uh, how, we, how we relate to animals. And I find it interesting that in 1718, uh, who was it here? Henry Frank Eshelman in his book, The, the uh, Historic Background and Annals of the Swiss German Pioneers of Southeastern Pennsylvania. I, I was reading through this and I came across this quote of an Amish man talking about how we should relate to animals. And he said this, this is a, a, a quote, uh, it is a crime to deprive any of God's creatures of life. Uh, and teaching our youth, uh, I'll, I'll just let it there. Uh, maybe I'll just read a little longer quote here. When the Amish first settled in Peque, its woods were infested by wolves and panthers. Uh, these animals committed great depredations, among, the, uh, especially among the sheep. The hunters would laugh at the Amish because they would not attempt to destroy them. They said in justification uh, that they considered it a crime to deprive any of God's creatures of life except those which God gave us for our use and that, uh, and that to instruct our youth in the use of firearms would lead to them to eternal. Forget the last part. I, I'm thinking about the first part there. Wow. What year is this? 17. This was written in 1718. 
that's wild. Yo, that that sounds like something you would read today of someone pushing for like animal rights or something. And this person, but they're coming at a completely different angle of like this is God. We're stewarding what God's creation here. That's that's not. I've never heard anything like so, that. So before. this is a quote, that's you incredible. know, by by Henry, Henry Ashelman. Interesting. Uh, you know, writing writing about the history of of Pennsylvania, and I'll admit when I read that, I'm thinking, wow, uh, it, you know, was this one Amishman or was I, I'm assuming he was trying to get a sense of the wider way of thinking. It seems like the the Amish was you don't just kill, you just yeah. don't go out killing animals. Uh, and I'm going to talk about how this idea has come up to the present. And I've heard it in my day. That's uh, phenomenal. But, but, but I'll, I'll, wow. I'll, the, the quote goes on to say, say this, you said the old Amish to the hunter, pursue the, pursue the deer, the fox, and the squirrel, and ne- neglect not only your farm, the land, mm-hmm. uh, but your family, the people. Hmm. We give your children bread when you leave them destitute. You are improvident. We are provident. Your race will be short. Ours will be long. In the eye of the Almighty, who discharges his duty, you or I? And he was being wow. a little defensive because they were, you know, saying, "Well, you Amish are crazy for not shooting the panther." That's so. that is that's something I've never heard anything like that but, before. But once wow. again, th- this is you know, was that all Amish? I don't know, mm-hmm. and, and I'm not making a statement. I'm really interested. I'd be interested in hearing if that was a wider. And I'm a little suspicious there may have been some Mennonite. Mm-hmm. Amish rivalry going on because just mm-hmm. across the way a little bit there was another uh, Mennonite who was inventing the uh, the American long rifle. So there might have been a little <laughs> okay. a little a little yeah. But but still that One perspective of, is 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 just fascinating. Has you know, something like, like that come and come to us to the present day? And the answer is yes. Hmm. Uh, growing up in church, I would hear uh, proverbs. Uh, and I'm not sure if I have written down the exact verse, but it says something like the hunter takes game. The lazy hunter, uh, you know, kills game, but then he doesn't cook its meat. Ooh. And mm-hmm. I, in my church growing up, I regularly heard exhortation that you don't hunt if you're not going to eat it. Hmm. In other words, you don't just go out shooting things. Uh, if you're If you're going to hunt things... It's going to be for eating. And of course, we could slide off on some other, and, and I'm not, you know, I'm not doing an anti-hunting screed by any imagine. Mm-hmm. But the idea that we are careful with 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 what God gave us. Uh, hmm. That that's I think that's really helpful context and get, getting boiling it down to okay, how how do our people live and what are some things that that we've done is really helpful. And I think you know, as people listen to this, they're going to have to do some self-reflection too of like, okay, so how does God want me to live this out? You know, um, you know, we have an example from this Amishman, you know, in the 1700s saying, here's how I'm choosing to care for God's creation. And there's, there's a, the piece about that, that I appreciate is the intentionality of it. Uh, and not necessarily, of course, we don't know this person directly, but that versus what seems to be the case sometimes is reaction, you know, so you have like an intentional response of, I feel like this is what God is wanting me to do based on what I see in scripture versus I'm reacting to whatever environmentalist thing that just came out. Nah, that's, you know, it's so easy to go down that street. And maybe that's something we can leave with people is like, be careful with that. Don't have that response. But instead, what does scripture say? You know, what what does God want us to do? Mm-hmm. Uh, which seems like that would be a little harder path in a way because you have to dig and and actually mm-hmm. come to a, a position on it instead of just reacting to whatever someone said that you don't agree with that seems like that would be the easier thing right uh, which which actually segues to I, I want to kind of wrap it up with a question along these lines so how can we as Christians think well about you know stuff we read that are um, talking about the environment or climate change um, and h- how how can we approach that in a way that's that's gracious and representative well of of how God would want us to live. Yeah, I think we often, the way we approach it is uh, that we need to uh, say everything about what the the climate change person says or the environmentalist, that we kind of, we, we approach it that they are wrong and so everything they're saying is wrong. Hmm. But what if we would instead use it as a segue to talk about, you know, God 
also loves his creation. For mm. God so loved the world. You know, th there's something in, in, in your heart mm. that connects you to God. God also loves his, for God so loved the world. And that's talking about the people. Um, but it, it's a good summary of how God, God's posture towards his creation. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, it's a nice segue. Not everything, there's much of what they're saying. Yes, it may be idolatrous. Um, yes, it may be, uh, they may be focusing on creation at the expense mm -hmm. of humans in a wrong way. Uh, and there may be other wrong things, um, but I think a good way to start would be say would be to, to to segue to the way it connects with what God actually asks us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, an environmentalist is saying that that you know maybe in wrong ways, but the right way is that yes, God did ask us to be good stewards of His creation. Mm -hmm. He loves His creation. He stood back and said, it's very good. And so we are also, as Christians, um, and we have, this is not, a, you know, some kind of a recent fad or something. We have been interested in, in, in being good stewards and living simple, not just talk about living simple, but actually living simple. Uh, you know, and, 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 you know, I live in a smaller house than I could afford because it does the job. I drive a smaller car and a more efficient car than I could afford because not because I'm idolatrous uh, about uh, worshiping creation, mm. but because I'm worshiping a God who has asked us to do good and be a good steward of, of what he's given us. Mm. Those are just some of the things that I'm thinking, a, a way that, that um, and yes, we call people away from idolatry, uh, you know, uh, worshiping the creation more than the creator. Um, but we also, our creator does love what he created. First of all, humans. Um, and, and, and also, it seems like he loves the land. He loves the animals as well. Um, and, and, and he asks us to take care of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's why we're doing it. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's a solid note to end on. And I just, I, I thank you for digging into this and being willing to share it. I, I think the listeners will have a, a lot to think about. I have a lot to think about from this. Uh, you know, what is God calling us to? How do we be good stewards? How do we um, care about what God has made? And what is he asking us to do? I, I, I love how we're framing it that way. And, and trying to pull this away from the, the intense conversations that can happen around uh, this position or that position on environmentalism or whatever mm -hmm. the case may be, going back to Scripture, what does God want us to do? So yeah. I, I really appreciate that perspective. And yeah, uh, yeah thanks for coming on, yeah. Matt, and, and sharing with us today. Yep. I'm glad to be here again. Thanks for listening to this episode with Matt Landis. If you'd like to watch the previous episodes we've done with Matt, you can find those linked in the description below. And if you like this podcast, leave us a rating and review. It helps more people find our content. And everything we've ever made is over on our website at anabaptistperspectives.org. Thanks again, and we will see you in the next episode.